Hello, I'm Jeunesse Castonguay, VP at Clarius. We're so thrilled to see so many of you join us here today for today's live webinar on ultrasound guided brachial plexus and suprascapular injections. Welcome to all of you joining us from across continents. Good morning, good day, and good evening. Over 1,700 clinicians registered for today's popular event, so you're in great company. We're excited to welcome back pain management expert, Dr. David Rosenblum, who'll show us clear proven solutions for treating neck and shoulder pain in patients who wish to minimize steroid injections and to avoid cervical epidural procedures. Very soon, Dr. Rosenblum will take you through the journey of two patients using video footage to provide clear step-by-step -step instructions for safe, successful procedures. We'll see clear visualization of his needle and anatomical targets. There will be an anatomical review followed by live scanning to help hone our technique and imaging interpretation skills. But first, I'd like to welcome your host. Dr. Aran Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California, has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career, and is a passionate focus educator. He now practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician. Dr. Frankel also serves as chairman of our Claris Medical Advisory Board. Welcome back, Dr. Frankel. Thanks, Janez. It's good to be here. This topic is another one that's near and dear to my heart uh, around interventional pain procedures. And we're going to set the stage with a bit of literature review, first by starting just a description and of peripheral neuropathic pain, which is really the problem we're addressing. We know neuropathic pain can have either central nervous system causes or ones from the peripheral nervous system, and it has characteristic symptomology with burning and electrical sensations. But what's surprising is that it can occur in up to 10% of the general population. And while there's a wide range of pharmacologic options to control this type of pain, often when such measures fail or when we want to avoid the use of medications, there are numerous interventional methods which are gaining traction in clinical practice. And one thing that we really wanna to emphasize today is that while we have many ways to help these individuals, we often underestimate the impact, uh, particularly the cost to the patient and society in terms of emotional consequences, quality of life, lost wages, and the cost of assistance from the medical system when it deserves more serious consideration, we think, for prevention, treatment, and control. As we've seen in past webinars, ultrasound is a very fast, accessible, reliable, and radiation-free imaging modality that can be used primarily sometimes to assess the soft tissues, particularly around the shoulder. And while it can identify a wide range of pathological conditions around the shoulder, it can also help us guide our musculoskeletal interventional procedures. And we know that it produces better results in terms of accuracy and clinical efficacy than when we do these procedures in a blinded fashion. Particularly intraarticular and periarticular procedures can be easily performed under continuous ultrasound. And there are many technical approaches and medications that can be used to treating different conditions and causes of painful shoulders. We won't discuss today, unfortunately, intraarticular injections or subacromial injections just because we don't have time. But what we will cover is the periarticular peripheral nerve block, specifically the suprascapular nerve, which in the setting of preoperative analgesia, people awaiting an operation or on a waiting list for an operation, or just pain treatment for glenohumeral osteoarthritis and adhesive capsulitis, it can really dramatically improve patients' conditions. And one other specific thing we're gonna to cover today is approaching upper extremity interventional neuropathic pain control with brachial plexus blockade. Ultrasound can dramatically improve the safety of this block as we'll see. And as we've covered in previous webinars, it really contributes to the decreased incidence of local anesthetic systemic toxicity and also likely decreased local complications, being able to watch our needle and the procedure unfold in real time. So before we jump into the meat of today's topic, I wanted to put up a poll and because we have practitioners from across the walks of practice and internationally distributed to see what have you experienced or do you see as the risks and limitations to doing some of these injections blindly for pain management? Have you seen or experienced inaccurate injections where the medication you're trying to deliver misses the target? or imprecise injections where repeating these procedures over and over again doesn't always go into the same place or reach the intended target. Have your patients experienced more pain than you would like or than they would like when you were doing the procedure? And have any of these resulted now in a required repeat of the procedure where you have to do it over and over again? Or have you heard or seen potential complications, either vessel nerve, pleura, or maybe even worse? Let's leave it a couple seconds here. Okay, we're gonna close out this poll. And just to see where folks are at, not surprisingly, inaccurate and imprecise injections, really, number one and two. And then, unfortunately, the complication 
uh, half of you have seen or experienced. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. And we really think that ultrasound and the research backs it up that ultrasound can help prevent some of these issues. And there's no one better we really can think of to help join address these complications and challenges than Dr. Rosenblum. And we're so happy to have him back. He's currently the director of pain medicine at Maimonides Medical Center, and he treats outpatients at his various office locations. Dual board certified in anesthesia and pain medicine, Dr. Rosenblum completed a fellowship in interventional pain medicine at New York University, where he also underwent three years of training in anesthesia. Dr. Rosenblum is the founder of painexam.com, and he's helped over 3,000 pain physicians become board certified through their educational content. Dr. Rosenblum, pleasure to have you back, and over to you. Thank you, Aron, and I wanted to thank Claris for the opportunity to be here today. Um, this is probably my third webinar, and it's always a lot of fun. Today, we're going to go over some of the procedures I'm doing and my patients, but quickly to address some of the items in the survey, um, I have a couple of slides here just to go over the technique. When you are doing ultrasound scanning, you have a two-dimensional plane. It's very important to understand that, and there are a lot of reasons why your block may not work or why you may get into trouble. First thing, remember, you're looking at the nerve, but where the medication spreads, there may be some fascial covering or the nerves may be in a sheath and you need to get within that sheath to get adequate local anesthetic spread on the nerve. Some nerves are actually embedded in muscle and that occurs with the scalene muscles, often C5. You may not be focusing properly. You may not be injecting your medication at every aspect of the nerve plexus to get the best possible walk. And you may also not understand where your needle tip is. So you may be out of plane and you'll see a cross section of your needle tip and you may be oblique. Oblique is a problem because you may actually see a longer version of your needle, but it may not be the true tip. So you need to understand that. If you notice, we're not, per uh, we're not perpendicular to the needle in the oblique side. So these are more advanced techniques. And sometimes you need to do this to get around bone or other structures that may be in the way. And we're not really gonna talk about much, much about this today because it's not really uh, as relevant for the particular types of procedures we're doing or talking about with my patients here. So the first patient, is a 40 year old female. She presented with left arm pain radiating down from the neck to the third, fourth and fifth digits. On MRI, there was a large inferior extruded disc at C67 reaching down to the T1 level and compressing the C8 nerve at the C7 T1 foramina. The pain started a few weeks prior to the visit and she was in so much pain. She tried a medrol pack before she came as well as typical Tylenol, NSAIDs nothing alleviated. So when I saw her, I did an ultrasound guided selective nerve root block at C7 and C8 with a fluoroscope to aid in determining the level. That's another talk. We're gonna be talking about what happened after that. Okay, but just to go over, this is her imaging. And you could see here, C2, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, you have your herniation and it's going to the left side. Okay, one level below we're looking right here and we see that there is some, um, some of the herniation into the, the fragment into the frame, and that is what's causing her symptoms. Okay, moving on. So um, she had 90% relief from that shot, but she did have some, some persistent pain that was radiating down the arm. Now, just as an aside, when a patient comes to me with cervical radiculopathy, oftentimes I will try to avoid an ultra fluoroscopic guided cervical epidural steroid injection. Procedure works, standard of care, however, you're sticking a needle millimeters away from the spinal cord. If it was my neck, I would prefer to try other things first. Now, unfortunately, in the United States, at least, CMS has not deemed the ultrasound guided selective nerve root block valid for payment unless a fluoroscope is used and contrast. So in the past, I've done these blocks out of necessity. Now I typically would do them with x-rays so that I satisfy CMS's requirements at the same time I'm doing right by the patient. And with an ultrasound, you can really avoid the blood vessels, visualize the nerve roots and get the medication where it needs to be. So this patient presented after that shot with pain in the axilla, radiating down the arm in the ulnar distribution. In addition, the pain not only started in the axilla, but was in the supraclavicular fossa. Neck pain was pretty much gone. And the arm pain was better, but she still had pain and she wanted another shot after seeing how much the first shot helped her. So we're gonna first go over anatomy before I get into the videos of the, those injections. Um, the interscalene brachial plexus is really the first group of nerves that will anesthetize as pain physicians or anesthesiologists or anyone who's doing pain procedures such as Oron or the ER docs. 
Then you have the supraclavicular followed by the infraclavicular and then the branches at the axilla. I call this the brachial staircase. You have roots at the interscalene region, divisions at the supraclavicular, cords in the infraclavicular and branches in the axilla. And if you note here, you see C8 becomes the ulnar nerve along with C1, of course. But this is why when you're doing the interscalene block, you're not going to get the ulnar nerve. Okay, and that's why probably the reason why at the time of the procedure, I opted to do supraclavicular and then axillary to make sure that we cover the ulnar nerve. Okay, when you're doing the interscaling scan, the ultrasound is going to be placed right here. You can angle upwards a little bit, it may help you visualize the nerves a little better. And you can see pretty clearly with this clarus, I'm using a C567, I'm, I'm seeing a C567 nerve root line up. At this level, we're talking about the roots becoming trunks. We call it the traffic light right there. Right. It looks just like a traffic light, yes. Yeah. Just color them red, yellow, and green. <laughs> Okay, so you have your scaling, scaling muscles, the anterior middle between them, the nerves are lined up once again. Um, this little picture on the upper left corner, it's a nice little picture. It's actually a parasagittal image. It's sort of between the interscaling and the supraclavicular, and it just gives you a nice idea as to where the, the muscle is, the anterior scaling, where the nerves are, and how as you descend down and go more lateral, they don't line up like the traffic light. They actually cover on, they, 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 they're on top of the artery in a more disorganized fashion than this. And you can appreciate your proximity to the lung. Here I'm scanning a volunteer and I'm finding first the interscaling nerves, which is right over here, lining up once again, like the traffic light. Okay. So anterior, you have the anterior scalene and then you have the middle scalene. And that's the pleura at the deep part of the screen. That's on right. The bottom left. Mm -hmm. Correct because I'm getting towards the supraclavicular fossa. You'll see I start to follow the nerves more posteriorly, and you can see that the nerves are start to disappear over here. This is a framing, okay? Right here, anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle, okay? The nerves are hypoechoic, okay? If, you, if any of you saw the video I just released yesterday about distinguishing the C6 nerve from the vertebral artery, Okay, they look alike because they're hypoechoic. You need to put Doppler on to distinguish between them. And I highly recommend doing that if you're considering these nerve blocks, especially at the beginning. Here I'm putting on the Doppler. Green light. Yeah. Here is the carotid artery. That's like chest. <laughs> What's that? Green light, red light. That's right. Okay. So now uh, moving on, this is another video I have. So we're scanning the neck, okay, moving lateral from the thyroid and the trachea. So you just see the nerves, they're lining up and I'm following the nerve back towards the foramen, okay? And you're seeing it disappear. Now, based on this level, I'm just gonna take a wild guess. I would think right here, that might've been C7. We were looking at C6 before, but because the anterior tubercle is not so pronounced in front of the nerve, I'd say C7. When you have a pronounced anterior tubercle, then it's probably chastronegus, which is more C6. Okay, so what happens? Patient has cervical radiculopathy, pinched nerve in the neck. They present like this. I have a pinched nerve, okay? There was a time in my career I had no C-arm available to do these injections on patients. So necessity was the mother of all invention, and I decided to do a peripheral shot to, to take care of peripheral symptoms of a central problem like cervical radiculopathy. And lo and behold, it helped. Helped to the point that probably 90% of the patients never need an epidural or a surgical consult. And I targeted either the supraclavicular brachial plexus or the brachial plexus or the exiting nerve roots after they left the foramen. Okay, more anatomy. This is a, a video of the cervical facets. You see with the ultrasound how clear they are how easy it is. Now I used to do a lot of these injections. I actually go for the medial branch nerves now, and I'll probably follow up with radio frequency ablation in many cases, burning those nerves. But I used to do a lot of cervical facet injections. Um, one, of the, one of the disadvantages to this approach is if you see the needle needs to come in from an angle and it could be a little painful for the patient. Um, you're going through a lot of tissue. So I prefer to do the medial branch nerve blocks, but that's another lecture. Um, getting back to the supraclavicular nerve, this is the coverage of the, of the plexus. You may or may not get the shoulder. It's not guaranteed. You will get the distal arm. 
What determines whether or not the supraclavicular brachial plexus covers the shoulder is if you capture the suprascapular nerve. If you're proximal to it, then, it, then, you, then you'll get it. If you're distal, you missed it and the nerve will need to be supplemented. Once again, here's that parasagittal view. Okay, just to give you an idea of the anatomy again before we show you the videos. Okay, this is a nice image of the supraclavicular brachial plexus. We have the subclavian artery, the brachial plexus is, it's hypoechoic usually, um, and it's, it's a little disorganized on top of the artery, not as clean cut as in the axilla or the infraclavicular fossa or in the interscalene fossa. And the nerve, the uh, ultrasound probe is resting on top of the clavicle. Okay, many anesthesiologists will take an approach from superior down with the patient supine. In my practice, I come from posterior to anterior. I figure if I go too far, I'm not going to be towards the lung. I'll just go through and through, which of course I would never do because I'm visualizing my needle all the time. And here's a video. So this is what that patient I told you about. She's after the selective nerve root block, 90% better, still having pain. I'm imaging her supraclavicular brachial plexus hoping to get the fibers that will eventually be related to the ulnar nerve uh, because that's where the distribution of her pain is. So I follow it down from the interscalene fossa to the supraclavicular fossa. Remember in the interscalene, you're looking at C5, 6, 7, you're missing the ulnar nerve. Now here in the supraclavicular fossa, ideally you will get the nerve, but remember I'm in an office. I'm not looking to give her 30 mLs of bupivacaine. I'm not looking for any trouble. This is not the operating room where I have all my equipment available or the ER. So I'm giving her just a few mLs. Now I'm, I'm also following her up, following the, 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 the nerves up to the neck, watching them go towards the foramen in the neck just for academic purposes. I'm not doing the shot here, but if you see here, the nerve disappears into the hyperechoic shadow with the hypoechoic bone. And we follow the nerves back to the supraclavicular fossa again. And I uh, have my assistant spray her with a vapor coolant spray. Then I anesthetize her with the 25 gauge one and a half inch needle. And I used a, a um, echogenic needle that was blunt here. I typically would use a 25 gauge one and a half inch or probably a three and a half inch needle for this type of block. I find it to be less painful, but here for the movie purposes, and to, to demonstrate, I wanted you guys to have a clear image of the needle and the 25 gauge needle is not as easy to find sometimes. And you can see my needle approaching the plexus. I'm gonna highlight it with my arrow, it's right here, okay? And it's gonna be really 12 o'clock of the plexus and um, moving in, okay? And I'm trying to get the, the medication to spread. It's a little difficult here to tell which of these fibers will be the ulnar nerve. So I took a chance. I gave her a few mLs of quarter percent propivacaine with dexamethasone in the hopes to alleviate the pain that was radiating down here through the axilla to the ulnar nerve distribution. And I uh, used the needle and the ultrasound to go to different aspects of the plexus with the attempt to get those fibers. I also love how you redirect, you know, I think it's helpful with a block needle to be able to redirect it and let go while you're doing your test injections and, and administering the medicine in different parts of the plexus. Yeah, thank you. Um, and another note, so there are studies, uh, the last one I read was actually in dogs where they did an experiment with the sharper needles. And yes, there is a risk of nerve damage with a sharper needle, kind of common sense. That being said, um, not only is the sharper needle less painful for the patient, the, I, I also find I don't need as much force. So I would be interested to see a study in which they looked at the, the amount of force you would need with a blunt needle to get in. And if that extra force, when you break through the fascia, if you contact the nerve, if that is associated with more nerve injury, I really would be interested in seeing a paper on that. Okay, so I did the procedure. Um, things that were going through my mind, well, not really, but things that I preempted that, you know, we, I always think about with this type of block is that, you know, if you're doing it properly, you're not in the interscalene region. So the phrenic nerve is very rarely compromised with the supraclavicular brachial plexus. It is possible, but low volumes though, I've never seen it happen. Um, your bigger, your bigger problem would be the pneumothorax if you're not careful. And if you see in the video that I just took, I was very far away from the, from the lung. I wasn't aiming at the pleura, unlike the way I did it in my former days as a regional anesthesiologist with a supine patient.
Okay, picture of a pneumothorax in case you forgot. I'm sure Aron did not forget, but you know, that's that's what's in the back of my head when I'm doing these procedures, especially in an office setting. My go-to medication will be low-dose bupivacaine, usually quarter percent. Maybe I'll dilute with saline if I'm worried about something. Um, dexamethasone, two to four milligrams. You could use more. Um, for a single nerve, there is a paper I, I read saying you don't really get much benefit beyond four milligrams. So typically I won't really use too much of it. I, I don't like to do a lot of steroids. And if you look at this picture here, this is how I'm avoiding the lungs. You know, Based on my trajectory and this picture, I'm nowhere near the lungs, so it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, for academic purposes, the infraclavicular brachial plexus block. I did a ton of these as a, as a resident at Bellevue. We would put catheters here, okay? You could see very clearly um, with uh, my ultrasound, the pec major, pec minor, the medial cord, the, uh, this is the vein, it's larger, but compressible. You can have the patient valsalva to make it stand out. Here's the artery, posterior cord, lateral cord. This I'd say is more relevant for the regional anesthesia world, less relevant in my pain practice. I just don't do these much in the pain world anymore. Great for anesthesia distal to the shoulder. Uh, great for placing a catheter. We would usually leave a catheter at the posterior cord for patients who had amputations and they were re doing the anastomosis for their fingers. A lot of the patients had to go back to the OR, needed catheter rebolusing. And we would test our catheter position with injection of air. Of course, you want to make sure you're not in the blood vessel. Um, the Infraclavicular brachial plexus, also your lateral to the lung. So the risk of getting into trouble is also minimal if you're doing it right. Okay, so the axillary brachial plexus, okay, relevant anatomy, you have the artery in the axilla, you have the medial lateral posterior cords around the artery. The radial artery is deep to the axillary artery, famous board question for anesthesiologists and pain docs. The musculocutaneous nerve is in the corticobrachialis muscle, okay? It's not really hanging out with the other nerves around the artery. This is what it looks like, a cross-section in the axilla when you're looking at the arm. Okay, when I say deep, it doesn't necessarily mean inferior, it just means deep to the artery, okay? You have the median nerve superior here, ulnar nerve inferior here, and you're getting anesthesia distal to the shoulder, and you can even do this block um, in the mid-humerus if you need to for some reason. Now, of course, my patient's not standing up like this when I do this block, but they're lying down with their arm extended and I'm coming from above, as you'll see in the video. Very important to have the arm abducted. It really helps with the way you do the block. Okay, so uh, once again, the musculocutaneous nerve, just note that it's, it's starting to depart from its friends in the axilla and go into the coracobrachialis muscle. This is a great video I shot with my Claris, and you can see really clearly how you have the artery in the axilla. The nerves are pretty clear here. You have the ulnar nerve, then the radial nerve deep to the artery. Okay, we're scanning like this, remember, okay? And the median nerve. Now I'm just going a little distal in my arm and then a little superior and you find the musculocutaneous nerve, which is quite easy to, to block. And the combined block will cover the whole distal arm. So here's that patient. She had residual ulnar pain now from the axilla. I took care of the neck. I took care of the suprascapular fossa. I really wanted to get her out of pain. So um, I, uh, I found the ulnar nerve, okay? I used my 25 gauge needle here and I'm giving just a little bit more supplement, okay? I trying to go above and beyond for my patients. And so you're anesthetizing the skin or you, is this you going in? Um, I believe that I'm using this as my block needle. Mm -hmm. So this time just using a regular 25 gauge. Yeah, I don't think I use, I, I think I did the whole shot. If you see, I have very low dose there too, low volume, I yeah. should say. Yeah. I'm injecting around the nerve and you're going to see the nerve pretty clear in a second. Um, you're going to see, it looks like there's two nerves uh, appearing right here. And don't worry, I didn't dissect out the nerve. Um, I'm not sure if that's connective tissue or if it's a variant. Um, I wish I knew, but either way, she finally got relief and she left a happy customer or happy patient, I should say. Um, and you see, I gave her really, I don't know, two or three mLs at most of quarter percent bupivacaine, but probably with two to four milligrams of dexamethasone. 
And it's amazing how the nerves really change from just above the clavicle, you know, hypoechoic, they kind of look like vessels, and now they look like nerves, like once they Absolutely. kind of pass through. And, and that's why it's important to get trained. Don't just pick up an ultrasound and do these blocks. You need to, either, <laughs> you know, have a preceptor with you, go to a course, watch these webinars. I mean, and there's, on, you know, between my content, Clarice's content, there's so much online these days. Um, so... This is another patient, a 70 year old, right side neck pain rating to the shoulder. Started in January of 2020, wasn't treated until February 21. So you can imagine if it's originally from the neck or if it's originally from the shoulder, at some point he's gonna get coexisting neck and shoulder problems. You can't walk around with, with consistent pain because after a while the pain itself becomes a disease and causes other problems. He went to a pain doctor, not me, someone else who did um, radio frequency ablation of the medial branch nerves of the facet joints at C2, 3, 3, 4, did not help. He went to a chiropractor, did not help. Trigger points did not give him long lasting relief. He failed medications such as flexoril, uh, physical therapy. He was told to get a shoulder replacement and he had limited range of motion. On his exam, he had what many of my patients will have, axial loading of the neck when they have facet arthropathy, tenderness along the facet line, and most neck movements are gonna reproduce pain. He was neurologically intact. Um, he did have um, shoulder uh, symptoms and signs on exam. He had tenderness, palpating the joint, the supraspinatus tendon, pain on internal rotation and abduction. He had a lot of limitation to the shoulder. If you look at the x-ray here, there's some joint space narrowing. So he had arthritis. So I'm not surprised the surgeon offered him uh, uh, surgery. So for him, I did the suprascapular nerve block. Um, just to re review the anatomy, um, you know, this is this suprascapular nerve I've probably been doing for at least 10 years. And what a game changer for my practice between treating shoulder problems of rotator cuff, arthritis, frozen shoulder, especially in patients who can't take steroids or you need to minimize steroids. It's a game changer. It's a lifesaver. Um, it's also been very effective for cervical radiculopathy. Why? Well, it's a good question. I'm not hundred percent sure why. I think I know why, but I think it has to do with maybe the disassociation of the shoulder muscles with the, the neck. Possibly there is also spillover into the axillary brachial plexus. I mean, I'll do this super scapular nerve block. The nerve does not go to the hand, but people will tell me, oh, my hand's feeling warm or my, the radicular symptoms in the hand are getting better. So anyway, you're talking about the supraspinatus muscle gets innervated. The infraspinatus muscle gets innervated. You get innervation of um, the, uh, it's the, 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 the nerve is under the trapezius, but you get 80% of the shoulder joint um, the nerve is not on directly under the trapezius, under the supraspinatus muscle, which is under the trapezius. Um, the nerve does not supply any skin of its own, okay? So it comes off the brachial plexus, goes by the notch, innervates supraspinatus, wraps around to get the infraspinatus muscle and sends fibers to the shoulder joint, okay? That's what you would see if that bone wasn't there. This is how I image it. I use the spine of the scapula as a shelf to rest my ultrasound probe on. Okay, go a little distal, play with the angle. And it has a very characteristic appearance. You have the trapezius on top, you have the supraspinatus muscle above it. The nerve lies right here in the divot under the, cost of the, the, uh, the transverse uh, scapular ligament. Okay, it's a hyperlucency right there. There is an artery running with it. And I use my go-to needle, which is a 25 gauge, three and a half inch spinal needle, which is a sharp needle. So do this really with caution, right? Especially if you're a beginner, you might want to do the blunt needles. I've probably done over a thousand of these with this needle. And the reason I use this needle is because it hurts the patient less. I've never had a problem. Okay. Another option is to use a bigger gauge, right? As you're coming in, uh, that's how we well, train people with this because you need a bigger one. Right. If I, but if I used a bigger gauge needle, I probably would use a blunt needle. Okay. Bigger <laughs> gauge and then sharper than I think you're really asking for trouble. Okay. If you're going to do sharp, do a small gauge because you don't want any problems. The other trick yeah. to the, if, if you're not confident or if you're scared to get too close to the nerve, you probably could go onto the scapular bone under the supraspinatus muscle and it will diffuse across and get the nerve anyway. The best thing, the slickest thing to do is if you get right into that transverse scapular ligament, not too close to the nerve and just inject and you'll see the medication tent up under the ligament and travel across to the nerve. Here's a CPT code. My go-to inject date would be 25% upivacaine, five, uh, five mLs uh, with five to, to 
10 usually, sometimes 20 milligrams of depomedrol, but really I've gotten away with no steroid and have had months relief in many of my patients. They've done really great with this block. And here's some, some evidence to support what I'm saying. Um, they've done this for patients with hemiplegic shoulder pain, patients with frozen shoulders, patients who've been in the ICUs. It's becoming a go-to shot. Um, it's also a target for neuromodulation. I'm putting peripheral nerve stimulators on this. I teach this at my course. I have a course coming up in Tampa where we go over the target. Um, we also are starting to do uh, the articular branch lesioning with either radio frequency ablation, chiro, chiro uh, therapy, cryotherapy, excuse me, not chiro, cryotherapy. So um, it's very useful, that along with the axillary nerve block. Uh, here's just an image of the nerves of the brachial plexus leading to the arm. And you can just appreciate once you're under the, uh, under the uh, clavicle, you have the infraclavicular brachial plexus becoming the axillary nerves and then branching out towards the arm. Other, other fun nerves to do, um, I'm sure this is useful for you, Aron, in the ER, the superficial cervical plexus block. Um, I do this a little bit in my office. Um, I, you, know, you can get the lesser occipital nerve, which is you know, a nerve or a neuralgia that will have headache-like pain to the mastoid process uh, behind the ear. You could treat uh, pain of the skin and fascia of the neck. So let's say somebody comes in with post-operative pain or a laceration to the neck. You could do the nerve block. You could also do it for uh, the clavicle fractures, which I'd say is one of the most useful indications. You're getting the supraclavicular nerve, not to be confused with the supraclavicular brachial plexus or the suprascapular nerve, because I had a whole bit to do with my coders a few weeks ago, because if I threw the supraclavicular nerve at them suddenly, and they're like, you mean supraclavicular brachial plexus? No, something separate, 64450, other peripheral nerve block code. And same thing with the axillary nerve and then the axillary brachial plexus, right? They're separate codes, separate procedures. You have to get that straight for your coders or else they're gonna send the bills back to you. So back to the plexus, you wanna have the patient turn their head, look at the sternocleidomastoid muscle midpoint. Okay, image the muscle as I'm doing here. And the, the muscle has a very tapered appearance. It's very characteristic, okay? It just tapers out. And your target is right here, the fascia behind the muscle. Sorry, I'm going to move that back here. Okay. Sometimes you can trace C4, C3 leading into this plexus, which is right around here. I don't think I traced on this one. Here's your scalene muscle. Okay, that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the carotid artery. I can attest to how useful this is in acute care. There's really no other way to anesthetize the ear without a field block, which is extraordinarily painful or any procedures we have to do on the neck. Um, the plexus is like a, essentially a painless procedure to get a huge amount of anesthesia. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I've never done it for that. Now here you also see the interscaling brachial plexus before it comes more superficial. Hmm. Okay, so once again, you're targeting right over here. Okay, I, I usually come in from posterior, two to three mLs, that's all you need. And you're gonna get a great block, do a lot of good for patients. I recently did one of these on a patient with post-mastectomy pain syndrome, why? Well, she also had referred pain up to the neck, up to the clavicle. She had a lot of clavicular pain for some reason and the block helped somewhat. This is the distribution, okay? I threw in the greater occipital nerve there. It's not really part of this plexus, but it's always <laughs> nice to know where that goes. Okay, um, if you guys are interested, um, I have more free webinar, uh, free videos. I have a newsletter on pain exam and my new project NRAP, which is, stands for Neuromodulation Regional Anesthesia and Pain. I wanna thank Cl Claris, they've really been helpful with all this. Um, you could probably play with their machines at any of my courses. I bring my own machine. I actually have two of them and um, I think you're gonna be happy with it. Uh, I hope to see you at Tampa. Either way, um, I hope to hear from you after the webinar and um, back to you, Oron. Thanks so much, Dr. Rosenblum, for the excellent content. Uh, we're gonna hand it over to Shelly Gunther, our clinical marketing manager, to do a live demonstration of scanning the brachial plexus as it travels down the neck. Thanks, Dr. Rosenblum and Dr. Frankel. Um, I'm Shelly, yes, I'm going to, uh, we have a model in, uh, in our video room right now, and I'm going to demonstrate uh, the brachial plexus in the neck. So I'm just gonna make my way over to, uh, over to our model and uh, we'll see what we can find. We do the interscaling brachial plexus. Um, maybe Dr. Rosalind can attest, it's kind of more of a selective 
C5, C6 block when I'm trying to really focus on shoulder pain, like you emphasize kind of getting the proximal upper extremity versus the lower extremity anesthesia? I mean, I started doing it in my regional anesthesia career as an anesthesiologist for shoulder procedures. It works great mm -hmm. for them. Um, we used to use lar large volumes though. So the phrenic nerve was always something we blocked. And in my office, right. that's the last thing I want to block. So, right. Yeah. 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 And for us too, uh, you know, a lot of our patients with COPD and respiratory conditions. Okay, Shelly, what have you got here? So I have the scanner, the L15 in this case, um, transverse on the patient's neck. And uh, I'm just going to turn my gain down just a little bit. And you can, as you can see, I've got the common carotid artery, but I need to be quite a bit more lateral on this. So I'm just going to slide the probe in the same plane, more lateral. And what we're going to do is we want to locate our key landmarks here, which are the um, anterior and middle scalene muscles. Turn my gain down a little bit more. One second here. And once we locate those muscles, it looks like the, uh, the uh, brach brachial plexus. Yes, the brachial plexus is going to show up in between the anterior and middle scalene muscles as three three or four hypoechoic nerve roots in this area here. It's like they're going if to you follow them. Mm -hmm. So if I follow them up. Is that the foramen there, right there? Oh, you can the see it entering right the foramen there. right there. Wow. Yeah, yes. Close to the tubercle. Yeah. 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 And then if I just scan down a little bit more inferiorly, and sometimes just by tilting the probe just a little bit, the nerves will just start to pop out and just be a little bit more obvious. So in this situation, I mean, we, we um, if, I, if I just turn our color Doppler on, we can just ensure that there are no vascular structures in the region. It looks like you have the vertical artery right below your uh, box right there. Yeah, right exactly. There, yeah. Right yeah. here, Vert vertical artery down there. there. So we definitely want to avoid that. <laughs> so from this, from this, I'm just going to slide the probe, staying in the transverse plane, inferiorly on the patient's neck. And we're still seeing the brachial plexus nerves here, but we're just going to follow those inferiorly to the level just above the clavicle. And we can see this pulsatile structure right here, which is the subclavian artery. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the supraclavicular brachial plexus in this area here. So again, if I turn my color Doppler on, we're able to see the pulsatile vessel. And look how close uh, the, the vessel is to the brachial plexus as well. Exactly, you right there. exactly. The branch right there. Right. Which you don't always see, this is just a variant. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just scanning a little bit more inferiorly. So we're seeing rib and pleura kind of underneath that area as well. So again, sometimes if you can't locate the um, interscaling brachial plexus, it's a good idea just to maybe plunk the probe down in, in the area just above the clavicle, locate the subclavian artery there and the supraclavicular brachial plexus, and then just scan up from there. And as you can see, we, you know, we, we can see the brachial plexus quite nicely as we scan up. And if you can hold it right there, I don't know about you, Dr. Rosenblum, but the way I learned and the way I teach is um, this prevertebral fascia here in front of the scalene muscles, mm -hmm. we often just kind of do a block. We kind of stay away from the nerve and just put a low amount of anesthesia just under that fascia here. Uh, just if I'm doing, trying to do a selective like C5, C6, maybe even a little higher towards the head. I'll tell you, that's actually a very safe way to go. And if you're not an anesthesiologist in the OR, it might be a good idea. If you're in the operating room, the block needs to be 100% or the surgeon is right. going to be up your, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on your case yeah. that yeah. way. <laughs> so, you, so you have to be very cautious with that. But uh, yeah, I, I always tell my anesthesiology uh, colleagues, I say, you know, when I do these blocks, especially like the sciatic nerve block, for instance, I'll use, I'll dilute up my local. I'll give two mLs of quarter percent diluted and eight milliliters of saline so they can walk out of the office. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and I'll tell them, I'm like, it's forgiving. 
you know, in, in the operating room, I need to have a dense, good block with complete muscle relaxation as well as pain relief mm -hmm. for them to work. So yeah, we have a little room. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Shelly. Yeah, you're welcome. We have time. I think we have time. Do you want to um, show us the axillary plexus too? Sure. Okay, Dex, let's get you to lift your arm up above your head. This is kind of your opportunity to do a real selective nerve block if you need to, right? Or like a really dense, uh, a dense block of the lower, the, the distal arm. I have the scanner almost right, right in the uh, transverse plane in the, mm -hmm. um, in the patient's axilla. And so there we can see the pulsatile um, axillary artery right here. And we can see the nerves probably median, ulnar, and radial behind. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rosenblum, yeah, that's Blum, definitely would you concur? I'm trying to orient what's, uh, what's superior when it's not, the, the nerve more superior would probably be the median and the one in, on the patient's, uh, I guess, distal to his head uh, would be probably the uh, ulnar. The ulnar, okay. And then the muscular cutaneous nerve we can see just right in right. this little fascial plane right here. Great picture. Yeah. And I'm, I have a vein just um, just underneath too. So that's going to be um, in the area of the radial nerve as well, right? So that is something we definitely would like to avoid. If Believe I compress- not, We can do these blinds. We go- Yeah, exactly. Aspirate yeah. blood and get to the other side. Yeah, so I can compress that. So I know that that's a nerve, but yeah, our nerve is, or sorry, a vein, but that uh, nerve is gonna be right in the, in the vicinity of that, so. Dr. Rose, yeah, Rosenblum, it's a good would, reminder you, would you not to push too hard when you're doing the injections? Yeah, uh, if yeah. you're pushing, you can compress the vein and you can still enter it with your needle, uh, not realizing that you're actually intravascular. Great. So that's, you know, very, very easy to find um, that uh, yeah. radial artery is a very nice landmark. All right. That was great. Uh, pretty quick and straightforward way to identify the nerves of the upper extremity, like Rosenblum showed us. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated but you do want to make sure we're safe. We're going to hand it back over to Janez here. Thank you, Shelly, for the fabulous live scanning. That was beautiful imaging. And thank you, Dr. Frankel uh, and Dr. Rosenblum's for your terrific presentations. Uh, Dr. Rosenblum, as always, we love uh, having the opportunity to share your strategies, in this case, to eliminate neck and, and shoulder pain. Just before we open up the floor to live questions, here's a quick poll, and we do have lots of live questions coming in, so it should be a very lively uh, Q&A session starting very shortly. Uh, but just before we open the door uh, and, and to our doctors answering your questions, we do wanna have a quick poll. We'd love to help everyone continue their journey in bringing ultrasound guidance to their practice. So please, please do complete this poll if you'd like any additional information. We do offer uh, Claris in over 90 countries worldwide and pricing does vary in different currencies. So if you'd like to get a quote uh, for one of our Claris linear scanners, please go ahead and select that option. If you'd like to opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your practice, we'd be happy to do that. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, we can do that. And if you'd like to book a demo, we can book a one-on-one -on -one demo as well, where you can see some of the beautiful imaging that we saw in today's presentation. Also, if you'd like to watch more tutorials, we've got video tutorials uh, with Dr. Rosenblum and other clinicians as well available, and we can send those to you by email. So while you take the time to complete this poll, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to Clarius HD, our line of high definition wireless ultrasound scanners. Clarius HD linear scanners are specifically designed for pain management with superior MSK imaging, and they deliver several advantages. Claris is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. This best in class imaging is what you need to get great tissue and needle visualization as you saw today. You get full visibility of tiny nerves, vascular structures, tendons and so on for safe um, ultrasound guided injections. The secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers and 192 elements and also artificial intelligence that together deliver the image quality only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost of cart-based systems. And with 
artificial intelligence replacing complex knobs and buttons is also so much easier to use, as easy to use as your smartphone. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement with no wires to get in the way or touch your sterile prep areas. And with no wires, Claris is so much faster to clean and disinfect as well. Only Claris delivers linear wireless scanners with a free ecosystem that includes free apps for your iOS and Android devices with free updates, unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage exams, and for unlimited users at no additional cost. Claris is so affordable and you can use a single device to share among physicians in your practice. So we're just going to close off the poll in five, four, three, two, one. I'd like to now welcome back Dr. Rosenblum and Dr. Frankel to answer your questions. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for our great doctors. Dr. Frankel, I invite you to moderate. We've got just a ton of questions here. Great, yeah, we'll try and get through as many of these as possible. I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, first one for you, Dr. Rosenblum, is what duration of effect do you see with the blocks? That's probably the most common question I get asked every day. And I get asked that question about 10 to 20 times a day. Okay. Um, basically, it varies tremendously. Uh, average patient after a nerve block or epidural or any pain procedure, if it's not diagnostic block, if it's therapeutic block, average follow-up visit two weeks after the procedure, 60 to 80% relief. Of course, it could be 10% relief. It could be complete, complete cure. I've seen that. I've even seen that many times with just lidocaine without steroids. So average 60, 80% relief is my answer. Nice. I'll relate. I just had a patient a week ago who I did a super scapular block for adhesive capsulitis. A young woman, you know, couldn't function basically. And I did uh, some long acting anesthetic with steroid, like you mentioned, and she walked out moving her shoulder. And it was the first time she had moved her shoulder in six weeks. So, uh, you know, I guess I didn't get the follow-up of how long it lasted, but it's pretty <laughs> stupendous. Um, when do you, on that end, no, when do you choose, you know, uh, solumedrol or methylprednisolone versus dexamethasone or different steroid adjuncts? And how do you decide? Okay, so uh, in my office, we carry mainly dexamethasone and depomedrol. My partners may use Kenalog. I just grew up on depomedrol. It's what I use in training. It's what I feel comfortable with. Uh, Triamcin alone is fine. I have no objections to that. Dexamethasone is uh, if I'm giving a nerve block close to any vascular structure, especially in the neck. So if I'm doing a selective nerve root block in the neck, possibly an interscalene, I would opt to use dexamethasone first. Because what, what is the reasoning so, for that? Right, the, part, sorry, the, the, the methylprednisolone and triamcin alone have particles. That's why it's white and cloudy. The dexamethasone is clear. So if I, God forbid, inject into an artery, there's less of a likelihood of embolization. And we're dealing with the vertebral artery, arteries that feed, feed the spinal cord. So we're trying to avoid oh. catastrophes. Got it. Makes sense. Um, how do you minimize, I think you addressed this in the presentation, blockage of the phrenic nerve, uh, either intrascalene or supracavicular? Okay, uh, lower volumes. Uh, intrascalene, you want to have lower volumes. And um, somebody has a question about bilateral. You don't want to do any bilateral intrascalenes or satellite ganglions. Um, you're just asking for trouble because if you block both phrenic nerves, you're going to need to intubate that patient. Yeah. One phrenic <laughs> nerve, maybe they could you know, reassure them, maybe a little midazolam. That's what we do in the OR at least, where they're monitored, not in the office. <laughs> so in the office, you just reassure them, observe them. But uh, I, in my office, I've never even had a clinical phrenic nerve block, even from an intrascaling. And intrascaling, the rate's over 90%. Reason why is because I'm using two to three at most, maybe one or two mLs of local anesthetic. And if you're worried about the duration, use lidocaine 1%, short acting. Does, uh, on that note, does um, adding adrenaline or epinephrine help the longevity of the block? And do you ever do it? Well, that's a great question. I have not done that since I've been in the hospital. When I gave anesthesia, I did it all the time. And it does. Um, we would routinely give more than the recommended dose of lidocaine in the infraclavicular fossa in Bellevue. And we were giving people up to 800 milligrams, which you shouldn't be doing. But we were doing it and I, we, under the supervision of our great professor who is well, very well published and well known. And we never had a problem, at least during my time there. There was never a problem because infraclavicular brachial plexus has very little uptake of local, if done right, as well as uh, the epi makes it safer. I'm not advocating to do it. I'm just telling you what was done and the advantage to use an epinephrine. It can 
reduce uptake and hence increase safety. However, in the office setting, I'm not giving enough local that I usually need to worry about that. I think this question, okay, let's see. Uh, this question comes up every webinar, so we have to ask it. What do you do about your sterile versus non-sterile prep? Talk, talk us question. through your routine aseptic technique or what do you do? Okay, so, um, I mean, I guess a lot of societies or guidelines will tell you everything's sterile. Well, what, what is sterile? I mean, if they're giving you a flu shot and they wipe with alcohol, is that sterile? It really depends on level of sterility. Um, I use alcohol for some injections. I use chlorhexidine for others. Uh, patient had their knee replaced and now I'm doing genicular nerve blocks. Chlorhexidine, okay? Patient may be diabetic or a higher risk, definitely chlorhexidine. Um, have I done a knee injection with just alcohol? Yeah, actually on myself. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's something that I have done. Um, probably the best practice would be chlorhexidine. It's not always available in every office, but it should be. Um, so if I was going to give the best recommendations, I would say chlorhexidine. However, I have not seen any infections with alcohol. So. And do you do any prep on the probe? Oh yes. I put a sterile tegaderm there. So you might not see it. Some people actually sterilize the probe itself. You can wipe it with a chlor 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 chlorhex wipe or some chlorex wipe or something, but I actually put a sterile tegaderm there and my needle tip is sterile and I've done thousands of these. So I know I'm not going to contaminate. And if I do contaminate, I stop and change everything. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you could be as sterile as possible. And if you get an infection, you're still gonna have to defend yourself. So, you know, better to document what you do and be as sterile as possible. Yeah. With sterile gel, right? So the, the highest would be, you know, chlorhexidine, tegaderm, sterile gel, right? right. And then, hmm. great. Uh, this question is a little specific, but I think I know the answer. Um, is there a role for a brachial plexus block for a cervical radiculopathy? You know, one explanation could be maybe metastases, cervical metastases that aren't responding to gabapentinoids, but I could think of other explanations for cervical radiculopathy. Maybe we'll reframe the question. What's the yeah. role of brachial plexus for cervical radiculopathy? I think you explained that in the, in the okay. uh, webinar, uh, but maybe you can. Like I said, I, I didn't have an option in the past. I had to um, do these ultrasound blocks because I didn't have a C-arm. And that was just a short period in my, in my career, but I realized it was working. And then I did some medline searches and I realized there is literature supporting peripheral nerve blocks for central problems. And I've even seen it in my patients who've had, let's say, lumbar radic, and they're on Plavix, they can't get an epidural. Yes, if they respond to a sciatic nerve block, it could be piriformis syndrome, of course. However, um, I've had situations where it, clinically it didn't seem piriformis, and they still responded. You're quieting the nerve somehow, and maybe it's through sensitization, wind up, you're interfering with that process. Somehow, for many patients, it works. If you're an interventional pain doctor, try it you'll be surprised how many cervical epidural steroid injections you're doing that you don't need to do. I have a very busy pain practice. I'll do one or two a month. And I see tons of cervical radic. So, and these patients are not miserable. They're not going to surgeons. They're, they're doing pretty well. So if they fail these things, then yes, I'll give them a cervical epidural. Yeah, from someone who doesn't do any uh, cervical or any epidurals, really, you know, when I, all I have is peripheral treatment, and it seems to work pretty well. You know, we see a lot of patients with central radicular pain, and we offer them, you know, what we can and the, the peripheral injections. I, I don't understand the mechanism. I'm with you, but it seems to work. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how do you recommend people getting better with the ultrasound to recognize nerves, recognize surrounding structures? What can they do in the meantime before they become black belts like you if they can't do a full fellowship uh, um, or something? definitely um, watch videos, take courses, go to workshops, have people walk you through uh, what you need to look for, what you need to be careful for. And then when it comes to needling practice on a gel mold or a phantom, um, I usually have that in my course, but if you want to buy your own, they're a few hundred dollars. They're not so cheap, but they're, they're worth it. And then if you have a good preceptor with you, I, I do private training as well. Um, people shadow me or I, I, I've been to other people's offices and coach them through injections. Um, you need somebody to walk you through these sometimes and just hold your hand while you do it. Um, and that's the way you become as, as proficient as possible, but just practice, 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 understand the anatomy and understand how to find your needle in position. The, the big trick is keeping your needle and your ultrasound as one unit. Okay. You move them together. 
So I always keep a finger on this and I jiggle my needle in and out to see the tissue tenting up and down so I can find my tip if it's not obvious. For someone who doesn't do blocks routinely, uh, what, which one do you recommend starting with? Which block or which ultrasound or which? Which block I think is what. Oh, okay. Well, the easiest would be just a trigger point in the muscle. In most muscles, you have a pretty wide margin of error. Of course, if you're at the rhomboids, you can get pneumothorax, but I'm talking about lower back pain, trigger point in the muscle, practice finding your needle tip and guiding it. Use a shorter needle, of course, one and a half inch. Don't go more than that. Um, that's how I would start. If you're talking about nerves, wow. I mean, theoretically, any nerve, if you're, if you're not careful, you could traumatize. So I would definitely just say start with a muscle injection, graduate maybe to a knee injection. And then nerves. muscle to joint and then to muscle to knee, then, then I nerves. think that's very safe. I think that's a way to yeah. go. Yeah. And maybe start with peripheral nerves and not more central. Yeah. Central nerves. Yeah. Agreed. Um, anything else? Do you combine, uh, you mentioned it, but maybe you can speak a bit. Uh, do you include cryotherapy or radiofrequency ablation? You mentioned it a couple of times. Like what's, where does oh, that play into your pain? That's a great question right? because our next Claris webinar, I, as long as the footage is what we expect it to be, it's going to be cryoablation of the clunial nerves. That's oh. going to be in January um, where I have a patient who I diagnose a clunial nerve box. Clunial nerves, by the way, are peripheral nerves in the lower back that have been missed by 99.9% .9 of pain doctors for the last 20 years. We learned about them in med school and we forgot about them. And now we're revitalizing them because of neuromodulation. We're actually stimulating these nerves, burning these nerves, we're blocking these nerves. And patients who have not received back pain relief are now finally getting some relief. Those, are the, those who suffer from the cluneal neuralgia. Are those the ones going to the glutes? They, yep, the they innervate the yep. glutes, they innervate areas that look like the SI joint and they, the, the syndrome can mimic sciatica. And mm -hmm. sometimes just lidocaine once will give you months to years of relief. I've seen it. Well, one of my colleagues wrote a paper on doing cuneal nerve block for large buttock abscess drainage. <laughs> Another That's, acute care application, yeah. there you go. <laughs> your thing. <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah, not in your pain practice, right? <laughs> All right, great. Well, I want to be mindful of people's time. We're at the top of the hour here. Uh, all these questions that we couldn't get to today, uh, we will follow up with, and uh, I'll have Jeanette close us out here. Thanks so much, Dr. Rosenblum. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for Dr. Rosenblum, Dr. Frankel, to Shelly for today's fabulous presentation. Again, if we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you by email in the coming week. You'll all receive a copy of the slides and webinar recording as well in the coming days. So please do keep an eye on your inbox. Um, at this point, we'd like to just say again, thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you in the new year for future educational events. And we'd like to wish you and your family a wonderful holiday season. Thank you so much for joining us today.